Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word. Let's hit the ground running here. What do you say? Deuteronomy chapter 11, we covered the first verse. And don't forget it. It said, therefore thou shalt love, I repeat, love the Lord thy God. That's what he wants from you. He declared it in the last lecture in his requirements of you. And those requirements are essential if you want his blessings. So never forget uh, the requirements there in um, this great uh, book in chapter 10, verse 12. I'm going to just reread it. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. That, that's When his blessings start coming your way, that's real easy to do. It's, it's just automatic. You can't help loving him with the riches he pours out on you in all things. And never forget to thank him for it and to give him the credit for it. Chapter 11, we're going to pick up with verse 2, where, where again he had charged them that they keep the statutes, judgments, and the commandments. Always. Not, not just for a while, always. We pick it up with verse 2, a word of wisdom in Jesus' name, and here we go. 11, 2 reads, And know ye this day, for I speak not with your children which have not known, and which have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand, in his stretched out arm. He said, I'm talking to you older people, not, not the children that were born while you were wandering in the wilderness that were not able to see all the things that he's about to reiterate here, verse three. And his miracles and his acts. We have a father of action. He's not just a, a writer or a talker. He has acts also, which he did in the midst of Egypt unto Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and to and unto all his land. You you seen an example there of God's love for His children. And many might say, "Well, what about Pharaoh?" Well, God discusses that in Romans chapter nine. When he talks about souls, he chooses to intercede in their lives. And he says, I'm the potter. I'll do what I want with the clay. All right? So even in this, he was teaching the Egyptians that he was God, not those little things they had standing on every corner. Verse 4. And what he did, and what he did unto the army of Egypt, unto their horses, and to their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea to overflow them as they pursued after you, and how the Lord had destroyed them unto this day. He said, I want you to look back on these marvelous things that your Father has done for you. Now, beloved, don't cut yourself out from that. Don't separate yourself from those miracles. Because God did that for you also. These things happened as an example, as it's written in 1 Corinthians 10.10, whereby you would know that our Father is with us even to the end, always. Verse 5, And what he did unto you in the wilderness until you came into this place. He fed them in that desert. He provided for them, gave them water. Uh, and so forth. Uh, just, just like he was uh, a shepherd, the great shepherd, looking over the sheep wandering in the desert. Six. And what he did unto Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the son of Reuben, 
who, how the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their households and their tents and all the substance that was in their possession in the midst of all Israel. In other words, when these two, when Dathan and Abiram rebelled against Moses, when he was God's man for that hour, certainly, he said they were, their complaint was, you've just brought us out here in the desert, left us from in the land of milk and honey, referring to Egypt where they were captives and brought us out here to die. We're not following you. We're not standing with you. And God had Moses to draw the line. And then God, at that same moment that Moses spoke, that he spake, rather, he, uh, the, the cleft opened, a cleft opened, and they fell in, and they were immediately covered over, Zappo, gone, erased, blotted out. So God is a father that demands discipline uh, when he performs of this manner and natures in your life, whereby you, they had the proof. Today you go on faith and don't worry, you have a lot of slack cut because of faith. You that have faith, though you haven't seen. These people had seen. So God didn't cut a whole lot of slack. Verse 7. But your eyes have seen all the great acts of the Lord, which he did. You know, you didn't have to have faith that God did that. They observed it, experienced it, were a part of it. Eight, therefore shall you keep all the commandments, which I command you this day, that you may be strong and go in and possess the land, whither you go to possess it. I want you to be prepared. They, Moses knew he was not going to be with them much longer, and I hope you can kind of tell as an elder brother how the, the tenderness that is in his warning as he recaps and recounts the events that transpired that they might know and understand. Again, being eyewitnesses to that greatness. Verse 9, And that you may prolong your days in the land, which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give unto them and to their seed a land that floweth with milk and honey. And you know, this great nation we have today, America, what a precious place it is that we overproduce whereby we're able to feed the lesser nations of the world. And um, uh, I know a lot of people think this is a terrible place and really there are certain people that are terrible but don't say our land is. God blesses this. Take a coin out of your pocket. What is it saying? God we trust. Take the Constitution. Where was it taken from? It filtered down from the very word of God, it's the, the word itself, whereby being the rules and the commandments that are spoken of here, in part, that we are to live by and should and do, the penal system aligning for those that will not but let it be when you enjoy the riches of God's blessings that you learn who he is and thank him for it. And then you're just beginning to experience the honey and the milk that flows from the true faith in the Father that literally did these things before the eyes of these people have the faith to know that transpired and the covenant still covers to this day. Hey, it's real easy. Just try him. There's just one problem with trying. You've got to have faith and belief and love or he's not going to touch you anyway and you don't deserve being touched. He has uh, this is one of the reasons I like to do the documentaries. If you look at the ancient writings, if you look at the travels, as, they, as God led them to these Americas and the, Euro, the, in the parts of Europe, that those nations are free nations, blessed of God. Chapter, verse 10. 
For the land whither thou goest in to possess it is not as the land of Egypt, for whence you came, from whence you came out, or where thou sowedest thy seed and wateredest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs. In other words, in Egypt, you had to carry the water or you had to, you know, that means with your feet, you carried it by the bucket full or you got on the big water wheel with your feet and walked it to irrigate. The Nile brought the water, but you had to take the water to the herb. How's it going to be different? 11. But the land whither you go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water of the rain of heaven. You're not going to have to carry it. God's going to deliver it. The same as he delivers in the end time, the latter rain, as he did the former rain. Do you understand the expression former and latter rain? The former rain is the rain that gives germination the sprout of the, of the seed and gets it started on its way. But then when it's ready to mature, uh, just before maturing, in its maturing stage, it must have that latter rain to to, um, to call, help it bring forth the new seed or it blasts in the field. It amounts to nothing. And if you don't receive God's word here in the end, the time of the latter rain, you're going to blast in the field and be nothing. You'll probably be deceived in the field, number one. So how fantastic God is. He said, you're not going to have to carry water. You're not going to have to pump it. I'll water it for you, the fields, that is to say. All right, rain from heaven, 12. A land which the Lord thy God careth for. Now, now don't read over that. A land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even into the end of the year. In other words, your father is not a seasonal God, here today, gone tomorrow. He's with you year round through all four seasons, helping you. Why? He careth. He cares about you. You know, some of you get so lonely and you think, I'm just all alone. You're not. You are lonely because you choose to be lonely because your Father is always with you. And if you pour out your heart and ask for companionship uh, and seek out um, other servants of the living God, you have that companionship. Just be able to discern in your choosing. No, God isn't seasonal. He's always. Verse 13. And it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently. Now, 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 don't read over that either. And I apologize, it seems I'm saying that a lot. But when you see the word if, you want to pay attention. If you're going to claim the promise, you've also got to pay the price. Let's read it again. And it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently. That means be sincere unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God, to do what? To love him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. That's necessary. It's very necessary. Quite frankly, I don't see how someone can help but love him when they look at this beautiful universe that he has created for us and himself. He created you for his pleasure. I hope you're giving him a little pleasure occasionally because if you're not, you're in trouble, 14. That I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, and that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil, that you'll have plenty, and it will be plump, well matured, and um, not famished as drought of the desert or any other place where you had to carry the water, because when God's water falls, each time it lightnings, tons of natural nitrogen are created by that electrical circuitry in the skies. 
and filters to the earth and it's natural. That's why that you see grass green up, not only from the moisture, the H2O, but from the natural nitrogen, not some chemical that some man has stirred up, but the real thing. And never forget where the fountain flows of the living water and who the living water is, because you must apply that in a spiritual sense to reap the full reward and understanding and the depth that your father communicates in the spiritual language in that particular verse. Do you want lots of corn? Do you want lots of wine? Do you want lots of oil? Those, are, those were the stables, that, that, that was the necessities of life. The oil was cooked with, for, used for medicinal purposes. It was used as the anointing oil of our people. Naturally, it's talking about olive oil. And, um, of course, um, the wine would later be symbolized of Christ's own blood because wine going through the, state, the stage of fermentation cast off all the trash. And it is the pure fruit of the vine, meaning Christ is pure. Verse 15, And I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. That's, that's, that's neat, right? 16, Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, uh, and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Don't let some man in his tradition, some false doctrine or denomination come in and pump you full of lies and fairy tales rather than sticking to God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse whereby you miss the blessings of God. You can be robbed if you're not careful. I love a church that teaches God's word, God's way, allowing God to do the talking and the commanding to the children instead of pumping them full of a lot of hot air, traditions, deceiving them. Do not let that happen to you. How do you prevent it? By checking them out in God's word. God's word flows in such a way that children can understand with no problem. And, and I know it offends some when I say that. I get letters that state it does. But really, I have little children that have a good working knowledge of our Father's Word and His plan. So you should be able to, if you have, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. So there's a big if up there. Do you do it sincerely? If you don't, I'm sorry, you don't qualify. Do you uh, understand the commandments, the statutes? Well, no, I don't. Well, get busy. For if, if you don't, I'm sorry, you don't qualify for the blessings. That's why it is important that you not let men deceive you because they will rob you They will, as they pose as good friends and no doubt their intentions are honorable. There's just one thing wrong with it. They have traditions of men rather than the word of God. And they pump you full of that stuff and never quite get around other than picky a little verse here and a little verse from there to make it align with their predictions. Won't fly, friend, 17. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, and lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. In other words, God can have it both ways. He can do good or he can send a curse. Guess who it's up to? You. Verse 18. Therefore shall ye lay up these my words. Lay up what? Provi provisions? No, lay up my, there's nothing wrong with laying up provisions, but here we're talking about God's word. Where do you lay it up? In your mind. Therefore shall ye lay up these, my words, in your heart, meaning your mind, and in your soul, being in yourself. 
and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. Now, many people misteach this, and I suppose rightfully so by taking it too literal, but it is only an analogy. What do you do with your hands? You work, you do with them. You take God's words and you do with them. You do what they say. You labor at it. And what is between, uh, as frontlets, uh, between your eyes, your brain? Use it. Absorb the words. Store them up in your mind. Your mind is better than any computer, quite frankly, if you will exercise it and stop hitting cancel, 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 or reject, or boot, 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 and uh, fill it with good doctrine uh, from the Word of God rather than garbage in, garbage out, out of the garbage pit of, of religion. Now, don't you dare say I said anything against good so-called religions. It just so happens Christianity is not a religion, but a reality. Fill your mind with the Word of God. I'm not telling you to become some fanatic. But if you want a good, full, peaceful life, bearing peace of mind in between your eyes, then you'll be familiar with your Father's words that bring you blessings as promised. Do you have plenty? Then do you want it secured? Then follow the commandment of God. Back to verse 13. And it shall come to pass, if you will hearken diligently, sincerely, are you? Or are you? do you play religion? Do you play church? Are you in it for real? The reality of Christianity. Verse 19. And ye shall teach them your children. That's important. Speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down and when thou risest up. Do you know why? We have children murdering children. Do you think parents are doing this? And because of certain legal systems, we have actually the word of God cast totally out of the schools. That is to say, morals. And they play in such mystical boom boom land worlds of imaginary that they don't know real from that that is imaginary. That's real sad. See that you teach your children. It is not that you should separate your children from the children of the world because we were sent to this world to do a job. That is to say, to teach, to sow seeds, to set an example. And you know, if you are, I wanna be real careful when I say this, if you use good discretion and teach your children to use good discretion, let's, let's, take, the, let's take the Easter egg for a moment. Yes, the Easter egg is a heathen practice. It it's, comes from Ishtar, now, and that's a fact, and if you don't know that, I'm sorry for you. You're in a heap of hurt. Um, it doesn't take much research to document that. Don't prevent your children from even touching a boiled egg, but rather teach them where it came from, the tradition, and what it's about and then they're gonna plant a good seed somewhere. Don't make them different. Don't make them, cause them to lose their credibility. You understand what I'm saying. A word to the wise is sufficient. The others, it doesn't matter that much. Verse 20 at the time for this time. If you don't understand what I just said, put it on a shelf. It'll be fine. Verse 20. And thou shalt write them upon the doorpost of thine house and upon thy gates. You know, when you learn spiritual um, discernment, you know, I can walk on a piece of property, I can see the door, I can see the yard, I can see the people, and I can pretty well tell you if they are Christian or not. Am I closing out other people? No, there are good people all over the world. They're all children of God. But I'm saying the mark of Christianity doesn't need a lettered sign. And uh, this word write documents that even back uh, 1,500 years before Christ, there was a vocabulary and there was a, a method of writing. And this is one of the reasons that in epigraphy that I so love to, 
chased the old hills and the streams whereby the ancient writings that are some of them um, found quite ancient even in this new world so to speak new world but uh, you can tell now if um, uh, if a Christian home it isn't only the appearance of the home I mean, you know, there's no farm that can be absolutely spotless, but you can have it clean. I don't care if, uh, you know, I can remember as a small lad when we, in West Texas, we lived in dugouts. That was quite a thing. And you know what it's kind of a, you know what kind of floor dugouts have? Uh, many of you might say, well, is it hardwood or is it tile or is it uh, carpeted? No, it's dirt kind of a clayish that when you, the little old feet padding on it long enough, it just packed down nice and hard, but it was swept clean. Do you understand where I'm coming from? I don't care if it's a dirt floor, let it be swept clean, uh, lived in. A house should be lived in. If you are, if you are uh, one of these people that won't let someone sit on your chairs or walk on your certain parts of your floor, then you're idolizing your house, not God. A house should be lived in. But um, I, I think I've said all I care to say on that subject. You know what I mean. You can discern spiritually a Christian home. You don't go around writing, I be a Christian. I be this or I be that. You don't, that's not what it's talking about. It shows, it's obvious. Like Christ would say, when you're salty, you leave a little bit of flavor wherever you go. 21, that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. That goes even to this day. It wasn't only that little spot of ground across Jordan. The house of Israel would later migrate over the Caucasus Mountains, settling Europe, and later many of us migrating to the Americas. The house of Judah basically migrated also, but they have returned basically in part. In part 22 for if you still if you shall rather diligently keep all these commandments which i command you to do them to love the lord your god that comes first to walk in all his ways and to cleave unto him 23 then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you and ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. World over, worldwide. Do you think we've ever lost a war? Some think we have, but we broke the back of communism in Korea and Vietnam. And if you want one of us old salts to make it clear to you, we can make it real clear. We didn't lose anything. We broke the back of communism and socialism, and all you got is a bunch of pinkos that like to wiggle and bask in the sun. That's why they're so pink. And just a little bit on the retarded side, and oh, I don't want to use the term of respected people for a bunch of uh, liberals. Because it's a failure. And you know, a bright person, it doesn't take them long to know, it has never succeeded. It is a failure because they drive God out. And guess what? They haven't read these ifs. If you do this, if you love me, then will I do this. So don't listen to socialist. And well, are you talking politics? No, I'm talking God's word here. See that you hear what your father has to say. Love him, worship him, and if some idiot comes along trying to drive God out of schools or anywhere else, then mark that person well. There's changes about to take place. Verse 24, every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. From the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even into the uttermost sea, 
shall your coast be. Yes, even to the United States of America, Canada, Central America, the Americas, bless Europe, the coast everywhere for those that choose to be free. God will help them maintain that freedom. That's why, for heaven's sakes, don't go to a nation that is free and let some church put you in bondage because of their traditions. What a waste that is. 25, there shall no man be able to stand before you. For the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that ye shall tread upon as he hath said unto you. Do you think that hasn't come to pass? Do you think people do not dread to go to war with us? Now, I'm not talking about some little skirmish over here where we don't have adequate, uh, if you don't have an adequate commander in chief or military person with experience is what I'm talking about. Don't go jumping the gun on me. That know what they're doing then you got trouble. But God has always, when we're in major wars, provided the military minds that have the experience uh, that are able to handle rather than some uh, would be, uh, oh well, enough said. You all know what I mean and what I'm talking about. Verse 26. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse still stands to this day. God has set before you a blessing and a curse. Which would you rather have? It's up to you. He gives you the choice, the blessing or the curse. 27, a blessing if, now underline that little word in red, if you will, I-F, if, a blessing, if ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. That is to keep perversion out of your military, that is to, uh, which the Bible is very clear on. He says, I'll let you lose a war if you allow it. Well, uh, that is very biblical. If you obey. 28, and a curse if, there's a, here we go, if ye will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. A, a church that becomes uh, uh, tr traditions and skips by with quarterlies and everything else, the word of God, rather than teaching the children from generation to generation how things should flow, then you're cursing yourself and your family. God didn't curse you. He gave you a choice. So you can do it God's way by placing his word in your forehead and loving him. That is to say, to become knowledgeable of what it is he would like you to do. Again, oversimplification? No, to love him, to trust him, to follow him. Or, hey, if you're one that likes that kind of action, take the curse. I guarantee you the promise is true. You'll get it. Boy, will you get the curse. You'll end up on some piano wire stage, uh, a bunch of religion that uh, they're running around like gooseberries rolling on a crooked deck, all right, bumping into each other and flip-flopping, and that's serving God, you know? Throwing coats at each other or spitting on each other and in the face and blowing them over. You know, you get all kinds of junk. And I know I'm just winning friends and influencing people, but be adult. Don't lose credibility of true Christianity by play actors, hypocrites, a hypocrite, the word simply means play actor. Well, are you calling people names? I never call people names. Hey, but I just teach God's word, and if the shoe fits, wear it. You have the choice. You can take blessings, or you can take the curse. Which is it? I wish you happiness in God's blessings, for a wise person would never choose the curse. 
take your father's word, put it in your mind, and don't let silly ways of traditions pull you to one side. Don't play church. Sincerely, that was the condition. Sincerely make a study of your Father's Word, praying for the guidance of the Holy Spirit to enlighten you in that Word and make you a child of the living God. Hmm. The choice is yours. Don't ever blame anyone else for it. You have the choice. He said it before you. Choose this day. Don't be like Nathan that the earth opened and swallowed. Gone. One day too late. And I'm not putting any pressure on anybody. It's just whatever you choose for life. You make your bed. Hey, have a good night's rest. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say, in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the mark of the beast. All right, there we are back again, the 800 number, 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, and Hawaii. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, share it. Please never ask a question pertaining to a certain denomination or some traditions of men thing. Let's just teach God's Word, and He's very adequate in letting the hot chips fall wherever they may, for correction and to heal and to cure nonsense, whereby a person can be sincere, which is the opposite of nonsense in God's word. A blessing or a curse, it's up to you. Take the blessing always. Trust me, the blessing is wonderful. And um, uh, let your question be in that regard. All right, those of you that listen by short wave around the world at this time, it's always a pleasure hearing your announcer at the end of the hour, Will give you our mailing address. Now, you got a prayer request, you don't need the number, you don't need an address, talk to him and remember, let him know you love him. Don't try to con him. But if you do love him for all the wonderful things he's given us and made available, sincerely seek that. Won't you, Father, around the globe, we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, touch, Father, in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. All right, let's get into some questions. We're going to take Joe from Mississippi. I'm a new Christian. I'm 18 years old. What do you do if you have doubts about your salvation? Could you can, or can you rebuke the devil and assume it's him? Or should you doubt yourself that you were worthy at the time of being saved. Could you please explain? Your Bible teachings are absolutely wonderful. They are changing my life daily. Well, well, thank you, Joe. God's Word is doing that. God's Word, when you put it in your mind, will do that. Now, the traditionalists say that if you are saved, that you're a new creature and you're not going to have bad thoughts and so forth. That's false teaching. Don't ever, that, that causes doubts in many young people. And in the first place, uh, Joe, many times uh, they will say, well, if, if you admire that pretty girl, that's a sin. Well, it's not. It's not a sin to admire a pretty, the girl next door. 
or whatever the case may be. God created male and female, he created them, and they're, they're his children, and, and you can admire them. That is just an attraction that is as natural as the day is long. It is lust. What is lust? Well, if you look on them with lust, well, admiration and that that is natural is not necessarily lust. Lust is when you put the make on everything that moves. You know, just my type, female, all right? That, that is lust and that is a sin. But to think that as long as you're in the flesh body, you're still going to have the flesh itself is going to put certain thoughts in your mind. Just let the spirit man override. The reason I'm saying this is some of these so-called Fruit Loops churches that would tell you you'll never have another bad thought causes a young person such as yourself, Joe, to say, well, I, I couldn't be saved because I still admire the girl next door. That is no sin. There's nothing wrong with that. And your salvation certainly worked. Why? Because it was Christ that saved, not man. So you are certainly worthy, though we all fall short. The most important thing, Joe, is for you to know that Christ was worthy to pay the price to forgive your sins. So you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Sometimes I sin. Sometimes I fall short. Sometimes you're going to. But that doesn't change the fact that Christ died on the cross saving you. Repent, and you're in good standing. I don't care if it's 490 times a day. Repent and love him, all right? Um, John from California. We wonder if you can watch, we wonder if we can watch you on Saturdays and Sundays. That's... It's too long a wait till Monday to see you again. Uh, one hour with you is not enough. We could go for hours watching you. Well, it's the word you're watching, okay, being taught. And I understand. We love you that much. Well, thank you. You love the word that much, and I love teaching it that much. Is there a station or a computer we could watch you on Sunday God bless you for all that you do and the staff. You're a wonderful church. Well, thank you. Christ Church is wonderful. And if you ever decide to join, take it up with him. And if he approves you, hey, you're in, all right? Um, we, we have our own transponder. Uh, and if you call the office, they will tell you what you must do. And you can watch us. We're, we broadcast 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And um, uh, it's a lot of teaching. We're there all the time. We also have our uh, have two different computer pages. You'll have to call. I don't know. I'm not much of a net person, but uh, if you make a telephone call, they'll tell you. Frank from Arkansas. Could you help me find the scriptures that talk about when Jesus went to hell and freed the captives? Well, I sure can. When... Naturally, when Christ paid the price, then blood sacrifice, which didn't do much good, was done away with for one and all time because of his blood sacrifice. And in believing upon him, it's all forgiven. So it would be very unfair for the people all the way back to the time of Noah to not have that opportunity, maybe like be sent to hell because they didn't have the opportunity we have today. God doesn't play favorites. So he sent Christ to paradise, as it is written in 1 Peter, or hell if you prefer. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19 speak of he going back to that time. And then read on into chapter 4 down to about the 6th verse, and it'll tell you he was very successful. He freed a lot of the prisoners. 1 Peter chapter 3, leading on into chapter 4. Tim from Ohio. It is written that in the last days, many, um, many deceivers and false prophets shall come. And also, those who are first shall be last, and those who are last shall be first. Could you explain what these two statements mean? Um, it is written, uh, the 
the uh, first, you know, I'm going to pull jump back on the book of Peter. It's this is written in many places, and the false teachers are those that come in the name of Christ, in. And Peter warns of this in 2 Peter chapter 3 in the first four verses. He said, it's going to get worse. There's more of them coming, claiming to be preachers of God. But they don't any more know the manuscripts or the word of God to teach it than they could, they could get a donkey to fly, okay, or pin a tail on it without hurting themselves. They can hurt a lot of people. But we've got them. Jesus, what was the first warning about Antichrist in uh, Matthew 24 and Mark 13? The first warning always from Christ was, be on guard for deceivers. Let no man deceive you because they will many come in my name claiming to be Christian preachers that will deceive you. What, what do they deceive you with? Traditions. For example, rapture, rapture, the word's not even in the Bible, and yet they get a lot of people to swallow it. It's sad, it really is. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. You have to go into the first earth age. In the first earth age, as it is written in Romans chapter 8, in verse, uh, long about verse uh, 28, 29, 30, that... Um, there that certain were justified in the first earth age. Why? They stood against Satan naturally and were foreordained. And they were first then, but they're last in this age. Why? To kick dragon. Satan is going to be cast out as the Antichrist, and those that overcame him then are living here in the flesh today. And they're going to kick, take names and kick dragon again. If you don't understand what I just said, put it on the shelf for a while. Cheryl from Maryland. Where is it documented that Satan is being guarded by Michael, the archangel? Inasmuch as it is Michael that kicks him out of heaven, it is Michael that guards him. Revelation chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. Michael from Tennessee. Well, we got a Michael here in person. Should we have statues of Christ in our home? As long as you don't worship it, it's okay. It's, it's just a likeness and so forth. It don't, don't worship the statue, though, because it's a chunk of marble or it's a chunk of chalk or something like that. The true Christ is in your heart, and he's in us, and he's within himself. So make certain you understand that. Tommy from North Carolina. You said if we love God, he will love us, and if we hate God, he will hate us. Would you please tell me where I can find this in the Bible? Thank you. Well, Tommy, I think you pretty well found the place today. He said, I put two ways before you, a blessing or a curse. But um, it is obvious I, can, I can't help but use Romans chapter 9 where he said, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Now, if you love God, naturally he's going to love you in return because you're going to be doing his commandments. But if you hate God, you're going to be stubborn against him. And guess what? Just like he hated Esau, he will hate you. I know a lot of people, well, God is not possible for God to hate. Well, now that's your traditions. Hang them, on, hang them on a shuck, light it, and let it fly away in ash because that's a lie. God does hate. God hates one thing, that he's losing a bunch of his children if they don't change their ways. Why? He loves them. That's why. And read the Bible. Malachi chapter 1 will tell you God hated Esau. And God, if, you, if you've studied the Bible, there's many times that he hates certain things and people that do certain things. Even the people that teach the rapture doctrine in Ezekiel chapter uh, 13, God says, I am against those that teach my people to fly to save their souls because they sow sheets and bed uh, pillows over my outreach saving arms and whereby they can't see the real truth of salvation and they teach them this flyaway junk. That's biblical. And yet people will listen to it by the drove in their ignorance and it's sad. It really is. I do not get any pleasure from seeing people deceived by so-called, well, just winning friends, influence, and people. Enough said. David from Texas, Tennessee.
David from Tennessee, what is the significance of five stones in the David and Goliath story? Well, it really wasn't a story. It was an actual happening, okay? just Let's just get that straight. I know what you're saying, but it's not just a, a, a fictional story. It happened. The five smooth stones, five is always symbolic of grace, meaning God's love. And Jesus would say, out of the mouths of babes comes this truth. And he was talking, that word babe meant little David, if you trace it to it. And David's words to Goliath are the most saving words you can read from God's scriptures. For it shows you that lad, and just a lad, knew that God's promise that he would let no man stand before us, not even Goliath. And those words came from David's mouth to Goliath. Hey, he did some real strong preaching that day. If you've never read it, you should. I have a tape titled Out of the Mouths of Babes or something to that effect. Read it for yourself. Uh, Marie Lou from California. In Genesis, it says, let us create man in our image. Who is God talking to when he says us and our, and where does it say the angels were created in God's image? Well, that's, that's family, number one. The gr- word in the Hebrew, I think, will be the best way to um, answer this, is Elohim. That's God and his children. Where, uh, Mary Lou, where did you come from? Well, I came from God. Well, of course you did. Well, then you were with him, right? And do you know something? That's what born from above, which is the correct terminology rather than born again, the Greek is very specific. It's born from above, from God, looking just like you look there, here. That's being born again. Born of water means of the bag of waters. Because you see, the sin of the fallen angels were they chose not to be born to woman, but to seduce women. And that's why we had the flood in the first place. Okay, I hope that, um, I hope that helps you. He was talking to his children. Um, that's why that when God, Christ himself was born of woman, he was in the image of God. If you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. It's very simple. Okay, don't let religi- uh, religious people confuse you about it. Read it from God's Word. Check it out. Vanna from California. Uh, how is a person saved? Also, I would like to know the meaning of the word calmly, as is in Psalms 33.1. I always thought it meant the same as homely, uh, meaning that... Jesus was somewhat uh, ugly. It's, um, it's nave in the Hebrew tongue, and it means suitable or beautiful. The, the Hebrew is very specific, nave. Uh, it's almost like the, say, not like the sacred name, but it sounds like it to the English tongue, Yahweh, nave, N-A-V-E-H. And it means suitable or beautiful. I hope that helps you. Linda from Texas. Question, God didn't create evil, so how did Satan become prideful and desired to be God and become evil since evil wasn't created and it didn't exist? How did Satan get that way in the first place? Is there a tape on this subject? Well, I'm sure I have one, and I can't think of one just offhand, but it's this simple. God gave man, his children, angels all. If you want to call them angels, fine. Satan happened to be a cherub. He had to give us free will, or he could not have uh, received the thing he wanted most. That's love. And this is something people overlook so often. God can do anything he wants to. Sure he can. He can make him a bunch of zombies that all they could say is, love you, God, love you, God, love you, God. But that wouldn't be love. Uh, It'd be like a man going out and buying him a rubber woman and saying, love you, man, love you, man, all over the thing, you know. 
It's uh, he, he wants the real thing, and he wants love from his children. So therefore, when you give someone free will, man has a way of working evil up within himself, all right, in his greed. And, of course, what was it that was his sin with Satan? Uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, verses uh, all about 16 through uh, 18 will let you know it was his pride that got him, that was evil. Kathy from Virginia, why do kids kill other kids? Because they're not disciplined. Because certain legal systems have driven God and family out of the school. There are no morals there. there it's all right to watch uh, horrid videos. It's all right to watch rock stars that talk about gunning each other down. It's all right to put this before them and that before them, but heavens to Betsy, don't put Christianity or morals before them. We, it's, it's a terrible, terrible thing, and it's time a stop was put to it. But the responsibility lies on the legal system that has forced this upon the people in a so-called precedent law, rather than law of yea or nay, but the law of precedence. That means according to what this good man says or that good man says. Well, I got news for you. No good man said that you can drive God away from children without having a bunch of heathen that do go around killing each other and feeding them drugs on prescriptions that make them suicidal and so on and so forth. Wake up. It's Don't blame it on the kids. Okay, I'm out of time again. And how wonderful it is that we have you that like to study God's word in more depth. That sure makes me love you, it does, but most important, it makes God love you, and he does. And uh, when you love him, let him know that, won't you? We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Most important, this though, that you stay in his word every day. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble, you know why? Because Jesus, our Savior, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.